everyone. We're gathered here this evening to watch an important movie together and to hear from the real heroine of the film, our alumna, Deborah Lipstadt, an alumna whose career has been dedicated to pursuing the truth even unto its innermost parts. Deborah, you have brought great honor to us here at Brandeis. Would you join me on stage? The Alumni Achievement Award, which we will present tonight to Deborah, represents the highest form of university recognition bestowed exclusively on alumni. The award honors Brandeis graduates who have made distinguished contributions to their professions or chosen fields of endeavor. Some of our past winners are Thomas Friedman, class of 75, foreign affairs columnist for the New York Times, Roderick McKinnon, class of 78, Nobel Prize winning scientist, Marta Kaufman, class of 78, and David Crane, class of 79, co-creators of Friends. Deborah Beal, class of 87, founder of the Posse Foundation College Access Initiative. And John Landau, class of 68, music manager and longtime Bruce Springsteen collaborator. Deborah arrived at Brandeis in the fall of 1968, just as the field of Jewish studies was becoming an increasingly popular and respected area of academic inquiry. While she was here, she focused her research on contemporary Jewish history, worked closely with Professor Benjamin Halpern, and wrote a dissertation on American Zionist leader Louis Lipsky. She earned her master's degree in 1972, and in 1976 became the 100th individual to earn a doctorate from Brandeis. She began her teaching career at the University of Washington and then moved to UC on to UCLA and then to Emory. She has served as a Doric Professor of Modern Jewish and Holocaust Studies, Modern Jewish History and Holocaust Studies at Emory for more than 20 years. Deborah has authored many influential books about the Holocaust, including Beyond Belief, The American Press and the Coming of the Holocaust, Denying the Holocaust, The Growing Assault on Truth and Memory, <coughs> History on Trial, My Day in Court with a Holocaust Denier, and the Eichmann trial. It is now my pleasure to present the Alumni Achievement Award to Deborah. I'm going to be very, very brief. Uh, first of all, just to express my gratitude to Brandeis. I don't think I would be here. I don't think I would have been in my academic. I don't, I don't think, think, I don't have to qualify it. I know I wouldn't be where I am today without the support of this university, uh, the support it gave me in my graduate work, the collegiality, the friends I've made, many, so many of whom are here uh, tonight. Uh, so in the spirit of, as we say in Jewish tradition, hakarat tatov, recognition of, of the good that has been given us, I am very grateful and I thank you very much. And in the proverbial, enjoy the show. It's been a long time. <laughs> Indeed it has. I last saw you in Harvard Square, I don't even know how many years ago it was. 20. 20 years, that's a frightening thought. 20 years. Turned on, by the way, or can you hear me now? You have to be very aggressive with it, or assertive. You, men are assertive, women are aggressive. <laughs> I'll be aggressive. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I last saw Deborah Lipstadt in Harvard Square, it seems, 20 years ago. And I was warned by her not to make this movie. Um, it was a movie about a Holocaust denier and it was her, I would have to say, not unreasonable fear that by giving attention to a Holocaust denier that I was aiding and abetting uh, their denial of history. Um, I understand the argument. I, of course, respectfully disagree because 
I am not a Holocaust denier. Um, I'm a Jew, not that that really uh, tells you that I'm incapable of denying history, but I have never had any reason to believe the Holocaust didn't happen. But an enormous curiosity about what would possess people to actually deny historical reality? What would possess people to, to actually believe something where there is such overwhelming evidence um, for its truth was false? And I interviewed among the various people David Irving. Um, and I would have to say it's still a mystery. I don't know if it's a mystery to you. Okay, before I answer that question, I'm going to, because memory is, you know, sort of ephemeral or... or um, Unassailable. Uh, <laughs> I didn't tell you not to make the movie. Yeah, you did. Well, <laughs> what I thought was that it was so clear to you, you and generally in your movies let the victim or let the, the subject hoist themselves on their own petard. You don't, you know, you don't generally bring in experts to, to elaborate or explain. And it was so clear to you that Leuchter was crazy and an anti-Semite, and wasn't making any sense. And as I remember it, that Sunday night, sitting in your studio watching The Rushes, um, that it was clear to me that there would be people who would hear him through your movie and would think, well, just like it, it, in the story in the, in the movie, that's an opinion, the other is an opinion. And I believe, no, I don't want to spend the time debating this. You know. There really isn't any debate. No, I know that. Um, but what I said is you got to get yourself some experts to explain why he's wrong. And Robert Jan von Pelt ended up in your, in your film as one of those experts. But there's a bigger question. We can debate that. We'll have a drink later and we'll debate this. Your, your, your other question, which I think is really the formidable question, what brings people to, to deny? Um, people like David Irving and even Leuchter, Leuchter is a, a bit of a, 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 I don't wanna say a nitwit or an idiot because that's too forgiving. He ran a scam on death, you know, he would go to uh, states that had penitentiaries and say, let me assess your, execution um, op apparatus, and if they didn't say yes, he would go to the people on death row and say, I'll testify that it's cruel and unusual punishment. He was, he's a, he's a, he's a, and he falsely pro proclaimed that he was an engineer, all sorts of things wrong with him. But people like Leuchter, and certainly people like David Irving, David Irving knew he was lying, because he knew, for instance, that uh, Judentransport aus Berlin, he knew he, when he said, I have a document that shows that Hitler ordered that there be no uh, destruction of the Jews. Himmler hadn't met with Hitler yet, but he, you know, when he says, Himmler was obliged to send out this, this transport, it's probably Leuchter. Um, <laughs> but I'm not paranoid. Um, someone like Irving knows he's lying because he's gotta make these things up. But I think he, someone, Irving and many other deniers, certainly those at the heart of the denial movement, are motivated by a anti-Semitism, an adulation of Hitler, Nazism, and in many cases, certainly in Irving's case, uh, a racism that, that makes them see the world in a very different way. Um, to look at the evidence and see the evidence, anything that proves the Holocaust is of course dismissed as forgery. Anything that can be interpreted as you know, um, questioning the Holocaust 
uh, becomes solid evidence. I mean, the Holocaust has the dubious distinction of being the best documented genocide in history. So for someone to, to deny it, there's got to be something else going on. And, and for me, that something else, possibly amongst other things, is anti-Semitism. It just likes anybody who would say either slavery didn't happen or on a more sophisticated, quote unquote, level, uh, oh, those slaves, you know, the slaves that uh, the First Lady spoke about in her speech in which she said, I live in a house built by slaves. There was a famous newscaster afterwards who said, well, those slaves were well fed and well taken care of. Anybody who can say something like that, or even say about slaves in general, oh, look, they wrote all that pretty music. They sang those songs at night. It was sort of like camp. You know, they worked hard, but everybody worked hard. Um, the only, only someone who is motivated by a deep-seated racism could say something like that. So, so it, it makes them look at the world through a prism which skews their vision. Uh, a prism of hatred, a prism of prejudice, racism, anti-Semitism. So we're dealing with, with hateful people motivated by hate. And, and I think that's what brings them to do it. The people I worry about, I mean, I don't think there's any changing their minds. I think David Irving at the end says, I'm, of course I'm gonna go on denying, which is what he said to Jeremy Paxman on, on late night television. Um, is the, you know, I, I, I sometimes use the analogy, Errol, of, you know, you get on a plane and you're in 16A and then in 16B sits down David Irving. And you make the mistake of saying, even before the plane takes off and it's a long flight, you know, and what do you do? Oh, I, I write, David Irving says, I write about the Holocaust. And you say, oh, that was a terrible thing. And then he says, well, it didn't happen. And he spends the rest of the trip telling you all the reasons why it didn't. I worry about the person in 16A. About David Irving, I, I, I have nothing to say. I can't convince him otherwise. Racist, David Duke, whose book, by the way, David Irving edited. Um, I have nothing to say, but, but it's, it's the people who listen and say, hmm, maybe there's something to it. Uh, I had this somewhat alarming experience um, in editing the film. And I'm sorry to say that it proves Loud Deborah. Enough. It proves Deborah right. Um, this is a horrible admission for me to have to make here. Um, I have a habit. Uh, I'm on the verge of finishing one film or another, and I take it um, over to the college down the street, uh, where my friend teaches film, and I show the unfinished films to his class. Uh, this is Harvard. And I showed an unfinished version of the Lucher film of Mr. Death. And the class was confused. Um, there were some people who thought, well, maybe the Holocaust didn't happen. And then there were some people who thought, the Holocaust did happen, but I was a Holocaust denier and an anti-Semite. Um, now, both of these results were intolerable to me. Um, totally unacceptable. And so I had to completely modify the movie. Um, this was a group of people who you would say are educated at least on some level. Um, and yet they were willing to sort of entertain these beliefs. Um, and so I had to completely change the movie. The movie, I don't like it as much because I had to sort of explain to people why Lucher essentially should not be believed why David Irving should not be believed, why they are wrong seems too simple. Because there is a mystery, and I do think of it as a mystery. You can call them anti-Semites, you can call them racists, 
but somehow it defers figuring out exactly what is this thing uh, wriggling in front of my lens? Um, what is the motivation? You know, I, I used to, I remember one incident that's portrayed in the film slightly different than, differently than it happened. But at one point before the trial, when we were still in the heavy duty preparation stage, I was in Anthony Julius's office and I said something about, I really want to beat this guy. I want to crush this guy. You know, not holding back. You know. And Anthony said to me, Deborah, he's, he's just not important. And at that point, Anthony and James and the other people in the office had been working on the case about two years pro bono. It was right before they realized that it was going to go to trial and they, they had to start charging, et cetera. And I looked at him and I said, Anthony, you've been working on this case two years pro bono. It's, it's taken over your life. And now you're telling me he's not that important. And that's when he used the line that uh, it's like the shit you step in on the street. He, there, David Hare has him said, you don't study it. But what he, what he essentially said was that um, it has no intrinsic importance unless you fail to clean it off your feet and you bring it into the house, you get it in the carpet, you know, then you're in trouble. Then you've made a mess and you've, you know, you've got to really deal with it. And I think in that, there's a certain metaphor or a takeaway, you know, I'm not saying it's the message of the film. I don't believe film should have messages. If the film doesn't speak for itself, then, you know, like at the end of a course on the Holocaust, I don't say to my students, now go out and fight prejudice. If they can't figure that out from having taught the course, then my telling them is, is, is wasted time. Um, but how do you fight the David Irvings or the Leuchters, expose the Leuchters, um, or the David Dukes, um, without building them up? How do you expose alt-right without giving it the oxygen of PR? Sometimes you have to. Um, but I think it's an enduring dilemma. It's an enduring dilemma. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, uh, I, spe I did spend time, I would be disingenuous to say I didn't spend time thinking about trying to figure out David Irving, but at this point, you know, I think the job is to expose the lies and to call people on their lies and when they make things up, to challenge them. You know, I, I, I just add one more point here because I mentioned alt-right, which I assume all of you know what that is. Uh, David Irving called a number of witnesses, uh, John Keegan and a couple of others, um, all of whom had to be subpoenaed to come. There was one witness he didn't have to subpoena who came willingly from uh, Long Beach where he teaches at Cal State Long Beach. Um, and he came to show that I was part of an anti-Semitic conspiracy. Um, his name is Kevin McDonald. Um, if you know anything about alt-right, he's the intellectual guru of um, alt-right. Um, and he expected, that Irving said, oh, he's going to be, I'll question him for a couple and a half an hour, and then, of course, Mr. Rampton will have hours of questions for him. And it was clear he had nothing to say. He was trying to show a conspiracy which didn't exist. You know, he'd find a newspaper, he had a newspaper article and said, Deborah Lipstadt spoke at a meeting of the American Jewish Committee or at this Jewish Studies program and said, see, she's, she's a puppet of these people. And the judge says, but evidence, evidence. And um, then Irving sat down and said to Mr. Rampton, no, you're, you're a witness. And Rampton, who was an unfailingly polite man, usually would stand up and that, that bow that I sort of learned to approximate um, and say, uh, no question to your lordship. And he just looked at Kevin McDonald, didn't stand up, head down to the floor, he said, I have nothing to ask this witness. But, you know, these are people who, here's a man who's a professor at Cal State Long Beach, has written books on anti-Semitism, which are anti-Semitic in themselves, but they parade as uh, serious scholarship. 
Um, I know what motivates that guy. The guy's a, the guy's a, a anti-Semite and a racist. Um, see, I don't think you can really understand. Anti-Semitism, racism, homophobia, all the isms, sexism, whichever one you want to address, is a form of prejudice. Think about, I always tell my students to think about the etymology of the word prejudice. Prejudge. I made up my mind, don't confuse me with the facts. I see a Jew, I know that they're rich, conniving, all the stereotypes from, from anti-Semitism. I see a black person, I know those stereotypes. I see whatever it is, uh, uh, someone's a gay person, I know that, it, I've made up my mind, I know it ahead of time. It's irrational, it's, it's stupid. Can you argue with stupidity? Uh, sure. <laughs> um, but what bothers me, still bothers me in all of this, I sometimes think that the study of history is the study of the denial of history. Um, Holocaust denial is a species of a much wider phenomenon, um, our capacity our almost unfettered uh, capacity to believe things that are inutterably false. Um, a deeply human problem. And calling them just simply names doesn't really resolve it to my satisfaction. No, you're right. You're right. On that, you're absolutely right. Oh, don't be too easy with me. I'm not. Don't. <laughs> Evening is young. Um, no, but I think on that, you're right. We didn't just call him names in court. We showed at least 25 different times by going, following, we followed the footnotes. We didn't follow the money, we followed the footnotes. And we followed the footnotes back to the sources. And as Richard Evans said in his report, every time we went back and we found a document, it either was a misstatement, a change of date, you saw a, a, a Juden transport, you saw what he did with that. We showed that over and over and over again. You're right, I, I, don't, I wouldn't just say, you know, to Kevin McDonald, you're a liar, you're an anti-Semite. I would take his, you know, I wouldn't want to spend much time doing it, but we did it in preparation for the trial, certainly, and though we didn't use it in court, showing how his work is skewed. You, you gotta do the, the hard work. You can't just say you're a bigot. You got to show. You got to challenge. Um, and I think, in you know, certainly in our country and in lots of other countries and lots of other places in the world, there's a real failure of that. I'll try to do this very quickly. Part of me, uh, as a Jew from Long Island, it's not quite Queens, but close enough. Um, <laughs> is to be reconnected with history. Um, and th there's a famous book of uh, Auschwitz documents uh, written by a Holocaust denier, Jean-Claude Prissac. And uh, in the book are facsimile copies of various very important documents about the Holocaust. And there was one document that truly fascinated me. Uh, a document that used the term for Gassingskeller, gassing basement. And it had been underlined. The facsimile copy was in black and white. And I went to the Auschwitz archive with Robert Jan von Pelt, and we pulled the document. This time, not a black and white facsimile copy, but the document itself, or a carbon copy, the copy that was retained in the Auschwitz archives. Not only was Vergausen's Keller underlined, but it was underlined in red with a red pencil. Uh, underlined so heavily that it almost gouged the paper, and then annotations that appeared at the top. 
uh, written by an SS officer who said this word should never, ever again be used in a document. Um, and I remember at that moment, maybe this sounds very, very silly, but for me at that moment, I felt connected to the Holocaust because you're sitting there in an archive with a piece of paper and a document and an annotation by an SS officer um, and the feeling, oh my God, all of this is real. All of this is real, unimaginable but real. Um, so for me, history is becoming reconnected in some way with the past. Um, in a way, <laughs> that's a crazy thing to say, these people have done me a favor, uh, forcing me to think about the nature of historical evidence, of proof, of self-deception, of lying. Um, but in the end, forcing, at least on this level, this personal level, the level of me at Auschwitz looking at a document in the archive um, to see the reality of the Holocaust. And so I thank Fred Lucher and David Irving for that opportunity. Well, they, it's not just in that one document, but they, uh, things like Pressac and Leuchter and Irving forced us to do much closer research and much more detailed research on the nature of the killing operation. I mean, I was talking to Tim Snyder, who teaches down that other state, you know, Connecticut, a little further from where you went to show your film. They probably would have known better, but... Uh, um, I'm sure you're right. <laughs> but, um, and he commented on the fact, something I really had, that as a result of my, of the case that Irving brought against me, um, in these past, you know, since he brought the case and the, the research we did and then subsequent, um, we know a tr much more about the, we've learned, we've studied, we've researched uh, many more details about uh, the killing operation, which before this people just sort of took for granted, but how did they operate? How did it, how did it work? Um, so, you know, in that sense, maybe something positive came out of this, this whole... Uh, I think many positive things have come out of this. Um, in the building archive, uh, the Germans, as they pulled out of Auschwitz in 1945, destroyed their main archive. Um, but if you've been to Birkenau, to Auschwitz II, you realize that this is a place I remember saying to myself, going there for the first time, this has been built on an Egyptian scale. It's immense. And there was a separate archive kept just uh, dealing with the elements of construction. And I remember also thinking at the time, the one thing I know about architecture is that it's premeditated buildings, gas chambers, crematoria, just don't pop up out of nowhere on their own accord. Uh, history is grotesque. Well, I, I don't know if I'd go there, but, uh, <laughs> but I, I will tell you that when we went, um, and there are pictures of this actually in, in my book, which, on which the movie is based, um, uh, Robert Jan took us, you know, and, and the fir our first stop was actually in the archives as he went with you. And we looked at the plans for uh, Crema one, uh, 2 and 3, the ones you saw the ruins of at the back of <coughs> Beer Canal. And those had originally been built, as James Lipson says, they had originally been built as morgues. 
and then adapted when they decided on the killing process, as they were, once the plans, they, in the, the plans were altered so that doors, for instance, to the gas chamber, which were supposed to open inward, were changed to open outward. You can see the changes, you can see the annotations and the changes on the drawings, because they opened inward, you couldn't open them because the bodies would be piled up against the door. Or a place where there was a slide, where you would slide a, a gurney down, because you, if it was a, a, a crematorium, you were taking dead bodies in. Um, but if it's a, a gas chamber, and live people go in, you changed it to steps. And you can see when you stand at the edge of these ruins, uh, the brick of the undressing room where it meets the steps that go down is two different colors brick, color bricks because it was under construction and then the, the different bricks were added. So, but sitting there, going back to your point of, of documents and looking at those plans and thinking someone had to draw these and figure out how this would work. And then you, you look at the ruins of the um, those of you who've been there, the other uh, gas chambers that were built further over uh, towards the side of the camp, which are built much more efficiently. They're all on one level. You don't need holes in the roof. You have uh, window shutters that open. You throw in the gas in through the windows. That they, it was the new and improved and more efficient uh, version. So um, I guess what I would say is that this this killing process was not haphazard, it was thought out. It was thought out by people with training and education um, and skills. Um, and that's part of what came out in this, in this trial, I think, you know, in, in, in my trial and in, in looking at those documents and exposing those documents. So. Do we have time for one or two questions? I know I have to run to Cambridge, but unless you want to. No, I feel what happened in London and what you did is a very important thing. It wasn't what I did, it was what was done to me, you know. <laughs> and as yes. I said, but, but what is still amazes, there still are people who think, you know, good for you for bringing that case, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Th there's an essay that I am very, very fond of that was written uh, by Arthur Schopenhauer. Um, I, I always think of him as an extremely funny philosopher. Um, uh, Arthur, stop me if you've heard this one before, Schopenhauer. Uh, so he wrote an essay on the art of controversy, how to win an argument says there's two ways you can win an argument. There's logic and there's dialectic. Now everybody knows you can't win an argument using logic. So let's pass on quickly to dialectic. <laughs> and then he proceeds to give you 36, 37 ways to win an argument any way you possibly can. Um, and one of them is after the person has completely demolished your argument, you look them right in the eye and you say, you know, I'm really glad you've come around to my way of thinking. <laughs> um, and it's interesting to see David Irving employing these same techniques. Um, if people want to believe things that are false, I'm not sure what you do. Um, I think you don't try to change them if they want to believe it, but there is a responsibility to keep them from spreading those ideas so that others take what's a lie as fact, as opinion. If I said to you, it's my opinion that the earth is flat, so it's crazy. Well, a lot of people think the earth is flat. That doesn't make it you know, flat. It's not that flat. <laughs> but, but I think it's really important to 
expose the lies, not to change the minds of the Fred Leuchter, not to change the minds of David Irving. It's not worth, that's not the point. That's not worth, if they were in a hermetically sealed, you know, cave and they and they weren't able to reach others. They yet. are in a hermetically but sealed they, cave. But they, their minds. Their minds are, but they, <laughs> look, we, we see it enough, you know, contemporaneously. Um, really? I'm, the, I'm not just talking about this country. Um, Brexit. During Brexit, um, Michael Gove, who was um, a minister in Cameron's cabinet, I believe someone here may know, minister of education, so it makes it even more frightening, right? Um, and he was being questioned about Brexit, which he supported. And uh, the questioner said, to the interviewer said to him, but the experts say X, Y, and he said, the British people have had enough of experts. You know, or um, the anti-vaccine people who are causing great damage and harm based on a complete lie. Or the Sandy Hook, now the Sandy Hook denial. Yeah, I don't know if you've all heard about the Sandy Hook, the yeah. town, you know it's not far from here where all those little children were murdered people denying that it happened. It's all a phony um, because it's planted by the uh, people who want stiffer gun legislation as a way of getting stronger gun legislation. Or the 9-11, you know, that 3,000 Jews were warned the night before not to go to work. Now, what does that imply? It implies that there's someone with a central address of, of all the Jews who work in the, in, the, in, the, in the World Trade Center and maybe the Flatiron Bill, we know exactly, you know, that it's all crazy. Or that 3,000 Jews could be told something the night before and not tell anyone. Oh. <laughs> Give me a break. You know? um, it's crazy. You know, or Bataclan, the, you know, the terrible thing in Paris was done by the Mossad as a way of creating hostility towards... These are all crazy ideas. But a book in... There was a book in, in, in published in French, which was that 9-11 was all a setup. I don't know whether they said the Mossad or the CIA or both, I forget. Um, it was a bestseller. And people glomp on to these ideas. And... People love falsehood. Yes. Here's one central idea in all of this, and what you have done, or if you prefer, what you have been subjected to, is there's this terrible postmodern notion, which I revile, that there is no such thing as truth, that everything is up for grabs. Um, two sides to every opinion, to everything. There are two sides to every opinion. And I respectfully or disrespectfully disagree mm -hmm. that there is such a thing as truth. There is such a thing as historical reality, a world in which things have happened or have not happened. And that digging our way back to historical reality is a deeply noble and important enterprise. So here, here. Thank you. Well, I think I think David Hare was very conscious of that when he wrote the screenplay here. Um, there aren't two sides to every story, um, and certain things happen. And what the end, the press conference. We there was a tape of the press conference, and I and I gave that to both uh, David Hare and to Rachel. Rachel watched it as well, and it comes. You know that there aren't two sides to every story. I do also want to, I know we have to end very soon, but a shout out to, to David Hare, not that he needs my shout outs, but um, everything that was said that's placed in the courtroom is from the transcript. Every single statement. Um, there was someone who said, oh, I like the film, but I wish you had had your moment of, you know, uh, that sort of, uh, Jimmy Stewart, Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Norma Ray on the floor of the factory. Erin Brockovich, you know. Um, it didn't happen. It happened to a certain extent at the press conference, but it, it didn't, and, and that's why it's not there. So it's really um, a film about a fight 
against lies, that is a truthful film, and, and I'm very, very pleased about that. Thank you.